Hey, hello, hi, welcome to and or back to the Jet Real Podcast. I am your host, Jill Treese, and this week's episode, we're doing the fun things. I have a story to tell you from a very eventful event, that's redundant, uh, <laughs> that happened the other night, and I've got some patron questions that I want to get into. So, let's get into it. Okay, are you ready? Are you ready? Okay, wait. Okay, okay three, two, one, go. guys okay so normally ads would go here but i haven't quite figured out how to do that on buzzsprout because i have to like apply for campaigns and stuff and like that's a lot of effort and that hasn't happened yet so um for now we're just going to do the patreon ad and it is a little formatted incorrectly at the moment and i haven't had time to fix it so you're just gonna have to deal with it sorry this is a high quality podcast we're putting on here <laughs> okay let's get oh, we got to get into that okay okay three two one go So the last ad before we jump into the content is one where you can support me and the horses directly. If you're willing and able, check us out at Jet Real Podcast on your patron app or at patreon.com slash Jet Real Podcast. When you become a patron of the podcast, you can ask me questions that I'll answer on the podcast, receive merch, and have access to live Q&A events, which means you get your questions answered in real time. Uh, At the higher tiers, you have the option for phone call consults with me on air or privately, as well as access to online training with me, depending on your tier. Ooh, fun. Uh, Lastly, should you decide to become a patron, just know you can cancel at any time and subscribe and unsubscribe as you please. And if you can't support us through Patreon, absolutely no worries at all. Listening alone is more than enough. And I just want to say thank you to all the current and future patrons. Me and the ponies appreciate it endlessly. Anyway, I'm going to stop talking and we're going to get into the part where I talk about things you're interested in. Okay, so I am currently recording this at 9.17, and I would like nothing more than to go to sleep, but I am paying the price for my procrastination (laughs) and having to record it right now. And I've got my buddy with me. She has to work at the school, so and she lives an hour away, so she stays with me a couple days. So this is a fun experience of having to record it (laughs) while there's a person listening in the house. I don't like it. Um, And anyway, um, I... I gotta tell you guys about an event that happened the other day, um, because it's it's worth having a little episode about. Um, I'm sorry, first of all, that this might be a bit of a deviation from some of the content. I have been ridiculously busy lately, and I have so many plans for guests I want to have on the podcast, and deep dives that I want to do, and specific topics, and all this awesome content that I I just am itching to get to, but I just haven't found time. Like, as I said, I'm recording this Monday night and, um, I just, I hate, I hate doing that because I want to keep putting out like really deep divey in-depth topic review kind of things. But, um, for now, this is at least an entertaining story. And then I'm going to answer some very long (laughs) patron questions, um, that maybe will give you your training question fix. So, let us get into it. So the other night, I am, I've had a long day. I'm sitting at my desk, just watching some Netflix, blowing off some steam, you know, and just hanging out. And I hear a really loud sound. And I was like, hmm, that's not fantastic. And if you follow me on Twitter, you already know where this is going. <laughs> but, um, oh God, it was so bad. Um, <clears throat> oh God, I just choked. So <laughs> I'm like sitting at my desk and I'm so tired and I'm ready for bed. I normally like try to take some like melatonin or something um just so I know that I'll like go to sleep easily you know (laughs) so I thought and so I'm sitting at my desk watching Netflix I already said that and um I hear this really loud sound and I have this really awesome defense mechanism where um when something frightens me like I hear a sound or like I think that there might be somebody outside where I just pretend it didn't happen (laughs) the first time and if it happens again then I have to acknowledge it um which is not fantastic and will probably be my demise (laughs) but anyway I uh I was sitting here and I heard this really loud sound I couldn't really distinguish what it was because uh I had Netflix playing as I've said three times now and um I turned around and my cat Wally my little orange cat he was sitting on my couch and he looked all wigged out and I was like oh that's not good now I have to pay attention to this and so I get up and I 
looked outside and I didn't see anything. And I was raised by a cop and also have watched way too much uh, Dexter and Blacklist and all those good shows uh, to just go wandering around the dark, you know, without alerting anybody. So first I called the people that worked here because sometimes they feed our little cow pretty late. And so I was like, well, maybe it's just them. Sorry if you can hear my cat sprinting in the background. I don't know why they always choose when I do the podcast. Doesn't matter what time just decide it's time to run but anyway so I called them they didn't answer and mind you this is at like 11 30 ish at night <laughs> and uh, I called them both of them uh, the wife and the husband and they didn't answer and I was like fantastic it's not them um, and then I called my friend who was staying with me um, you know just so I could have somebody on the phone she's got my find my iPhone on and everything so I was like okay if I get taken <laughs> I mean maybe you can direct me or call the police or something um and I didn't call my dad because I knew he was asleep so I was like I'm trying not to wake him up but she didn't answer either thanks for that bud <laughs> um <laughs> but then I called my dad and he was like hello what <laughs> and I was like hey, sorry, there's some ruckus outside. I want to check it out, but I also don't want to be dead. So I'm just letting you know, stay on the phone with me. And he was like, okay, cool. So safety tip for everyone out there. So I like put on some pants because who hangs around their house in pants? Not I. Um, please don't come peeping in my windows. That would be not my favorite thing in the world. Um, anyway, put on some pants, put on, um, my slides and went outside with a flashlight and I'm like looking around and uh, I went around like the long way around my house and I didn't hear anything and then I turned the corner and then I heard running and I was like mm, that's definitely a horse doesn't sound like it's where it's supposed to be but it might be in a paddock you know I don't know why it's running at nighttime because um, they usually are pretty quiet at night um, so I was like, this is super weird. And I heard it way too close to my house. And like, I have paddocks on either side of my house, but it's, they're far enough away. I know what they sound like, you know, I don't know how I know, but <laughs> I guess I'm used to it. And this one sounded different. Um, but I was concerned that like, maybe it was a truck. Somebody was like pulling up to the stalls or something. And so that's why I called my dad. Um, cause I didn't know that it was a horse running. Um, and so then I like, when I do notice that I heard horse, I'm like, okay, there's a horse running. I don't know what's going on. So I walked to the paddock directly in front of my house um, where Ruler, Shotzi, and Curvy, a new horse um, that we have that we're keeping for somebody. Um, I, I go out to their paddock and I was like, well, Curvy's new. Maybe she's running around or something. Um, so I just, I went to that paddock and I'm like shining my flashlight and Shotzi's up by the fence, but Ruler is way in the back corner and I was like that's super weird they're hardly ever back there at night because the hay is up front and you know at night time it's getting a little cooler out here so I was like maybe they're just you know like I don't know what's going on because they're usually up by the hay because it's cold and they want to keep warm so they eat and um I was like I don't know what's going on and then I saw Kirby like walking up to me and I was like okay well everybody's moving slowly I don't know what I'm hearing and just about that time you know my dad's asking me like what county I'm in so he can like have the police ready to go <laughs> And, um, I, sh just about that time I shine my flashlight over to where ruler was. And then I keep panning, um, towards our back woods and I see a bunch of eyes and I hear thundering hooves. And I was like, uh, oh God, that's not great. And I was like, there's a herd out. I don't know which one it is. And then I saw the little ones and then I, in all in one swoop, I see all of the mares and foals. Some go through the gate. Others took down the fence. They like busted through the fence like a movie. It was like spirit, <laughs> you know, and they all like bust out of the stalls in the, in the Civil War people's things. Wow, I know so much about history. <laughs> um, but anyway, so they busted down the fence and I'm like, oh God, everyone, everyone's dead. <laughs> so um, for context, where they were, um, <clears throat> we used to have two stallion pens, so they're like separated and there's all this fiberglass fencing, which isn't what it sounds like. It's, if you've ever seen my pictures and you see those like round posts that like are a strange color, um, it's made of fiberglass and it, um, I don't know whose idea that was, but we're slowly trying to get it all gone. Um, but if you touch it, it gets like a rash on your, wherever you touched and it, you like get little pieces of glass in you and they're like teeny tiny, they're like hair like say like one more time. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's not comfortable. And so we're ripping it all out. But at the end of them, there are these big concrete 
bases. Um, so they're all ripped out of the ground. There's a trailer, like a flatbed trailer with a bunch of wood and everything you need to make a fence <laughs> there, including nails. And um, they've taken down like uh, one of the run in sheds had a stall door and we've taken that down. And like, so there's a bunch of shit laying around all over the place. And I'm like, oh my God, the baby horses and the moms, they're all running frantically. Like they're not paying attention. They can't see super well at night. I think I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure they can't see like super well. Um, I already said that <laughs> God, it's so late. Um, so anyway, I'm like freaking out. Cause I'm like, they're all dead. And they, and I just watched them bust through a fence, like knock it down. And I'm like, there's no way somebody's not bleeding out. Like this is not a good situation. And then, um, after they busted through the gate, they made a turn and they were coming straight at me, <laughs> this entire herd. So, um, you know, just to give you an idea, it's Misty and Sterling, Dixie and, uh, Dexter, Astro, Irish, um, Azula, Lady, Cleo, who's pregnant. <laughs> and, uh, so that's nine horses that were running at me dead on. And I was like, oh my God. So I'm on the phone with my dad swearing. <laughs> my dad is a very, you know, proper man. And I was like, this is, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I'm panicking. Oh my God. My cats are creating so much ruckus. Um, anyway, so I am like swearing and freaking out and I'm yelling, whoa, and trying to get them turned back around because my next thought was, I don't know if the front gate is open or if it's shut. And, um, so I was like, okay, split second decision. They need to go back to where they came from, even though it's dangerous. It's less dangerous than them being out on the highway. <laughs> so, um, I, got them turned around like and just threw my arms at them and was like go away and they went right back to where they were um so I hung up on my dad hopped in my car and drove like faster than I have ever driven down our little gravel road <laughs> um and the gate was shut I checked the other gate to make sure it was shut and all the while I'm calling the people that work there like over and over and over again and they're not answering and I was like of course of course they wouldn't answer the one night <laughs> and so I get my car turned around drive all the way around our driveway because I didn't want to open the gate even though that might have been faster I didn't want to risk it um so I drove all the way around the farm because it's like a u-shaped driveway and um I pull up to their fence and they've got um like one of their daughters was outside and I was like you need to go get them right now if they are inside they need to come out and help me catch these horses all the mares and foals are out I need help I cannot get them all there are way too many <laughs> and they were like okay and she like ran inside and got them and I drove as fast as I could back up to the where the horses were like I drove through a paddock <laughs> instead of taking the road and uh threw my car in park jumped out ran and grabbed some halters and um went to go get them but it was so dark I couldn't see and my flashlight was scaring them so I was like okay I'm gonna get stepped on or trampled or something so I opted for shutting the gate and like trying to stand the fence up and then when they got there I was like just park your fence in front of or your <laughs> park your fence park your car in front of the fence so that they don't try to come out that way again uh, when we lead them out and the guy that works here, I gave him a halter and we caught the two hardest ones to catch. Go figure. And um, we led them out and the herd kind of ran in front of us and then pulled back. And we were just trying to lead them as calmly and slowly as possible to get them back into their field and finally got them all in. And I checked on everybody. I was watching them all as they were trotting to make sure nobody was uh, limping or anything. And I checked all their legs and everything and everybody seemed okay. And I was like, oh my God no way. <laughs> There's no way that all just happened and nobody has a scratch on them. Um, but they don't and that I've noticed yet. So I have fingers crossed. Everybody's okay. Um, and I mean, this happened like I think two or three nights ago. So stress. Um, but we got them all back in and, uh, they all just kind of followed in single file, except for Azula's mom lady. <laughs> I had to go catch her. Um, she was just grazing. It was a frantic graze. She was definitely worried, but she, um, was just hanging out. She let me put a halter on her and I just let her into the field. And then we got the gate shut and everything and everything seemed fine. And I was like, all right, well, that was an experience. And I turned around and our little cow, Charlie, <laughs> It was just meandering around up by the trailer and we were like, Charlie. <laughs> and I literally herded him into the pen. And so this is all about midnight now. And, um, so then after we get everybody all squared away, I'm like panicking that the other horses, cause you know, if horses get out, if you've ever witnessed it, the other ones tend to go ballistic. So I checked on Zoe and her herd. And then I checked on all the ones around us and everybody was just hanging out. And, you know, of course I was super worried about Lexi because she colicked presumably because of having horses that weren't supposed to be where they were behind her. And, um, so 
everybody was okay and they were all hanging out you know i was super concerned also say super one more time (laughs) she's so repetitive um but uh i was concerned about her um as well because the weather has been dropping and like rising and dropping and rising and dropping and that tends to have them colic for whatever reason um so i was just like okay i'm just gonna do a do a night check on everybody make sure we're all good and um everything was fine so i came back inside and then stayed up for the next hour and a half laying in bed staring at the ceiling because i couldn't sleep (laughs) so that is how that story went very scary make sure you close your gates is the moral of the story now i'm not saying that the dude who feeds forgot to shut the gate but the clip was not unclipped or was not broken and neither was the chain so you know one might believe you just forgot to clip it (laughs) and um either that or it just didn't clip well enough or something i don't know what happened uh misty sterling our little appaloosa dude um his mom tends to lean on the fence and so i don't know if that had anything to do with it but nothing was broken so i don't know um but you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> so, um, anyway, that was my eventful little story that took 15 minutes to tell. <laughs> um, but yeah, so check your fences and, uh, try not to be in full panic mode. I definitely was. And, uh, me and my father have not addressed the swearing. So <laughs> I think we're just going to let that one lie. Um, but anyway, that was my super fun nighttime experience. And uh, I hope that that never, ever happens again, (laughs) because that was terrifying. I did not like seeing an entire herd of horses come barreling after me. That was not fun. But now that I've burped and I've made this an official burp stamp podcast, I am going to go ahead and get into the patron questions. So question number one of two um, is from anonymous patron. So I will almost said her name. Can't do that. Or their name. I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to misgender anybody. Don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable. So we're, we're welcoming here. Um, so this is a long question. Fair warning. I did try to shorten it, I think. <laughs> um, but here. It's written very comically, I believe. So I'll, I'll fill you guys in. Okay. So backstory. I've been having some trailer issues, but also not, question mark. I'll explain. Last summer, the last time I traveled or trailered falcon my horse anywhere it was a debacle knowing what i know now of course it was a debacle i was an emotional wreck and so was he anyways haven't trailered anywhere since uh summer 2019 and eventually had an opportunity to hitch a ride with my friend on her trailer to our trainers we do joint lessons at my trainer's place i thought since a few things had changed since last summer started some positive reinforcement work there would be another buddy on the trailer and there would be shavings in the trailer it would potentially go smoother I wanted to play it safe, though, so my friend showed up 45 minutes early to load Falcon on, and it went really well, question mark, like three to four uh, tries to load him, and I was so happy. The next week, like last Thursday, I don't know when this question was, it might have been a week to two weeks ago, um, we were doing another lesson, and I got cocky (laughs) and told my friend to show up 15 minutes early instead, 15, sorry, that tends to sound like 50 when I say it for some reason. Um, assuming it would go well. Well, it didn't go well at all. (laughs) At this point, I was also going through um, some Zoloft withdrawal. I was four to five days without it waiting for the new, um, oh, I always forget. Is RX just the prescription? I don't know why there's an R instead of a P. It should be PX. (laughs) Anyway, um, so I was getting uh, upset and frustrated easily. The first time we walked on, he almost got all the way on, except one foot was too far back to do the butt bar. He backed off, so I made a circle to reapproach. After 15-ish minutes of this, I think I started again, or I started getting upset because Falcon started to not go on as far. The cycle continued until 30 minutes later. I was in tears and couldn't get Falcon even near the ramp. I know this might sound ridiculous, but I swear Falcon's got a read on me. He's absolutely, uh, he's an absolute smartass. Literally, once I had the clicker in my left hand and I was petting him with my right hand, and he quickly used his nose to click the clicker and then stared at me for a treat. LMAO. So sometimes him knowing me so well doesn't work to my advantage. I should clarify, I wouldn't want him any other way. I see it more as he's really good, or he's a really good problem solver, not a naughty horse. Regardless, he knows me too well. When I started the Zoloft, uh, there was a huge change in his demeanor around me within a few days. I'll die on the hill that he can read me like a book. I swear that's all that's relevant here. Um, or that this is all relevant. Um, basically a long way of me saying, me getting worked up equals Falcon getting worked up. I personally relate to this a lot because the same thing happens with me and Zoe. We both spiral up together very quickly. 
Um, so at this point I knew I was in no state to try and load him and was about to give up. My barn owner, bless her, she's like a second mom, came down to help me load him up. I think she saw how upset I was and just wanted to make it better by getting him on the trailer. She didn't do anything overly harsh by any means, more just not letting up on the pressure much. She got him on within 10 minutes with the pressure and my friend tapping on his butt once or twice. She also didn't let him circle and reapproach like I was doing. They got him on the trailer and he seemed to settle down, leg cocked, and had a, had a bite of hay. I know that doesn't necessarily mean he calmed down, but those are some signals I noticed. Um, I will uh, interject here and say that sometimes um, a leg cock doesn't necessarily mean like resting or relaxed. Obviously, I have no idea based on this situation whether, you know, what emotional state the horse was on because that's only one piece of information. It is comforting that he had a bite of hay um, to some degree, but um, you guys hear me talk about the language signs and calming signals of horses book by Raquel Dreisma a lot. And um, she said, um, you know, because all behavior is context dependent. So, you know, just because you're smiling in one situation doesn't mean it, it means you're happy in all situations, you know? So for instance, if you are with a friend and you're laughing and smiling, it's not necessarily the same as being uncomfortable at a cash register and smiling at the cashier. Those are two different um, circumstances where you employ that behavior and horses are similar. And if you read that book, which I recommend everyone who has ever <laughs> contacted a horse before, um, you read. Um, so a leg cocked could mean they are snoozing or they're relaxed or they're just chilling out or it could mean they are prepared to put that foot into motion and push off and run forward so it's kind of like a um oh what is the word kind of like a um, preemptive preparatory behavior if you will and um a bite of hay sometimes horses will do that as a calming signal you know to other horses they eat like i was saying with lady um, when she was just hanging out outside the pasture after we got all the horses in in my earlier story um, she was eating grass and a lot of people I think would look at that and be like oh look how relaxed she is she's just eating grass but she was chewing really fast and like ripping it out of the ground and that's an anxious behavior where they're trying to calm themselves down because chewing releases endorphins and is their calm state so she was trying to calm herself and alert you know her unknown surroundings around her that she was not threatening and you know um also could be motivated because it was good grass so i don't know it but there are, i'm my point is it's context dependent and just because she's eating doesn't mean she's relaxed and i think we do that a lot in the horse world we're like we're like it's a one-to-one -one. so um while that's not to say that your horse wasn't relaxed i'm offering it as a possibility that it was a trying to calm himself down if that makes sense a self-regulating behavior i mean um, <clears throat> so anyway, and you said you, that doesn't necessarily mean he calmed down. Um, but just wanted to throw that out there. So, um, the message continues and says, then my friend and B.O. What does B.O. mean? Body odor? <laughs> um, barn owner. I got it. Sorry. Uh, came to comfort me while I'm in tears and trying to comfort Falcon with as many treats as I can give him. LOL. We got to my trainers and he unloaded fine and was chill for the entire lesson and loading back up. It seemed only the loading itself was the issue, but maybe I missed a few other behaviors that day. Last lesson, I tried to combine the mes methods that my barn owner used and methods and my methods like food motivation as a calm as and as calm a demeanor as I could have. I was back on the meds, so that helped a lot, and I tried not circling and reapproaching when he backed off. I got him on alone within 10 minutes, which was awesome, and I let my barn owner know via phone call. She said something along the lines of, great job, you just need to make sure that he doesn't get to choose not getting on. And then my brain went, um, no, wait, hold on. <laughs> um, in all caps, by the way. Uh, that's why I giggled, because it's funny. Um, uh, okay, continuing the message. And I kind of realized that's exactly what was happening, question mark. <laughs> I told you it was kind of funny. Um, like, I realized that me circling and reapproaching last week was literally me saying, okay, you don't have to get on this time, but I'll ask again in a minute. And he was probably like, bitch, you're an emotional wreck. Why would the fuck out? Would I follow you anywhere? Um, which I'll jump in and say is probably not what he was thinking because he's a horse. <laughs> um, and also, that's mean. Don't be mean to yourself. Um, so uh, they continue to say, and then this past time I was basically saying, take your time, but you're getting on this damn trailer and I'll wait. <laughs> uh, then I started to feel really bad about technically not giving him a choice. I know I just needed to do some wording work oh my god loading work on my own that's a given he seems not to be scared of the trailer itself i think i just really work him up okay so now the actual question since i know my emotional state affects falcon so much in the situations where he's not getting on the trailer is it better to 
keep reapproaching and risk me getting upset. I know I shouldn't, but my brain doesn't know how to not demand perfection yet, which will make Falcon upset. Or be more firm with uh, pressure when he's at the ramp and get it done in what seems like a calm yet forceful way. Um, I think it's interesting. I'm jumping in here, Jill, uh, to say that <laughs> I think it's interesting that um, you used a qualifier that says uh, get done in what seems to be a calm yet forceful way, um, which I could be psychoanalyzing because that's <laughs> that's what I enjoy. But um, to me, it sounds like that's not the answer you want me to choose because <laughs> you said seems instead of get it done in a calm, forceful way, you know, um, anyway. Uh, or remove myself from the situation and let someone else load him or remove both of us from the situation entirely. Don't feel bad if you think this is the right option. <laughs> well, I'm just not the type that's good at giving up, nor should you be if you don't want to be. Um, or if you have other ideas, please let me know. I know this is a perfect storm of my mental health control issues versus equine behavior, but any advice would be helpful. Okay, so that was a very long explanation, but as you guys know, and I have said before, um, it's really helpful to get this much information because it really gives me a pretty good picture of what's going on so that I can address it in you know, a more accurate way. And I don't have to go through every single possibility, um, just most of them. <laughs> um, so the first thing that I want to say is you talk a lot about, um, uh, how you are affecting him. And while I think that it is, um, I think that it definitely does affect the horses when we get worked up or anxious or frustrated. Um, horses can read your facial expressions. They know which ones are mean, scary faces and which ones are the calm, relaxed, I love you, <laughs> I have food for you um, faces. But with that said, um, I don't, like, <laughs> I don't know, I'm, I'm sensitive to um, that much self-blame and it's because... I also come from a place where I have, um, you know, dealt with a lot of mental health things, uh, namely depression and that sort of genre. And um, just it's I, I just hate to hear about things like this and read it because it makes me so sad that you're blaming yourself so much for something that isn't your fault. Um, and is something that is so easily fixable, even if you are anxious and uncomfortable. But I think that the alternative solutions that I can provide will help fix both of those things. But I just, I really want to encourage you not to be so critical of yourself and so harsh on yourself about this. Um, and in other realms, you know, you're doing everything you can to help your mental health, um, you know, and you're doing the best you can. That's how we all are with horses. And I know it's so hard not to be super down on yourself and, um, you know, self-deprecating in moments like that. And then, you know, <laughs> you just, I, I think, um, you were actually there on the live stream. Um, and we talked about this a lot, actually. Um, if you guys don't know on the, uh, Patreon once a month, I do a live Q and A and, uh, I just, <laughs> we just are supposed to talk about training questions, but for some reason, this most recent one just ended up being like a really interesting mental health conversation. And I really enjoyed it because, um, while I love talking about horses, it was a change of pace that I didn't realize that I would enjoy doing, you know? Um, but, um, I believe you anonymous patron were a part of that. And, um, I just, I want to say, I hope that you took some things from that and that it's okay to struggle and it's okay to have issues in your training and things that you want to work on. But, um, there's, you don't have to be so hard on yourself. It's not your fault. Um, and when we know better, we can do better. <laughs> and um, offering some advice in the training realm, I hope will help mitigate this and give you both some more confidence. Um, but again, I just, I really want to stress that you are, <laughs> you're doing good and there is no need to, um, you know, from my perspective, there's no need to, um, you know, feel so, responsible for, um, what you might be doing to your horse emotionally. Um, because let's face it, <laughs> our horses can handle it. Most of us that interact with horses are drawn to them for one reason or another, but 
I have noticed a common thread that a lot of horse people do (coughs) oh my god I choked struggle um you know with mental health and emotions and horses tend to be our solace and our safe place so when things like this go wrong you know there can be a tendency to feel like oh my god I suck at everything even the one thing that I'm supposed to do to be pulling away from all of those bad feelings is making me feel worse and then it just compounds and then on top of that you already feel bad because you think you're the reason that your horse is resisting you and then um then you compound with shame by saying that like oh my god I suck so bad I'm making my horse do this he can totally see me I need to have somebody else do it I can't do this I'm making it worse and then you start beating yourself up and then it just gets so much worse for you because you've lost your confidence and now you feel bad (laughs) and then all those emotions come up and then it becomes a really bad experience for both of you so um, it sounds like both of you just need some counter conditioning and I think it'll be okay. I don't think this is a big issue. A lot of horses struggle with trailering. It's a big scary box and it sounds like he is not even anywhere near <laughs> the worst um, or on the um, the really challenging end of the spectrum from my perspective. Um, so to get into the actual training part and I hope that <laughs> what I said about you know taking some of the pressure off yourself is somewhat helpful because I know it can sound super lame and you can be like, oh yeah, all right, whatever. Um, But I genuinely mean it because I have been there and I know what that feels like. And it's frankly, hardly ever actually the truth. And um, it is just a part of us that tells us that we're not good enough. Um, But that doesn't mean it's right just because it is happening, you know. Um, Kind of like the trailering experience, you know, it's happening. And when, um, you know, your barn barn owner used more forceful methods than you would prefer, it happened. You got the horse on the trailer. But that doesn't necessarily mean it was right. You know, I'm using a metaphor here, please. (laughs) Negative reinforcement, traditional people who use force to get a horse on a trailer don't come for me. It's a metaphor, okay? (laughs) Um, But just because it, it happened doesn't mean that that was the right way it happened or um, that it is true. So um, I hope that made some sense. (laughs) But anyway, for the actual training portion of this, I do not think that um, your energy is playing a huge role, especially if you are trying your hardest to stay calm and be respectful to your horse. I think you are doing an excellent job. Um, So all you have to do at this point, from my perspective, is just getting comfortable with it. So you said... um, I think down here when you uh, were loading him by yourself that um, I think you should see if you could do that more often. Like maybe if that friend would be okay with, um, you know, just kind of like maybe coming to hang out with you, you could be like, you can use my computer, go watch Netflix or something while I (laughs) play with my horse um, if you don't mind. Um, But I just, I want to take the time to work him through this in a way where he Um, and I both can develop some confidence around this issue and then um, we won't have this problem anymore and then we can just jump in the trailer and go. Um, So if they would be willing to do that, that would be a huge help. Um, Or if your barn owner has a trailer um, hanging out that you can attach to a truck, (laughs) then I would recommend um, trying to see if you could do that. I know Adele at The Willing Equine on Instagram and YouTube um, has been posting a lot of content. I think it might be the reels or the IGTV or it might be a feed post where she shows some ways to set up like a faux trailer um, so you can sort of, you know, practice initial steps. But it sounds like he's fairly confident with the trailer, so that might not even be necessary for him. Um, I have seen a lot of people work through it without breaking it down that far, but it just depends on where your comfort is and what is available to you when you're trying to practice these things. Um, I would recommend, um, that when you're doing this, like you offered some options and, um, you know, your first statement is, since I know my emotional state affects him so much, uh, when he's not getting on the trailer, is it better to keep reapproaching and risk me getting upset? Um, so the, um, person in me that has been a, um, therapeutic client and please, I'm going to go ahead and preface and disclaim here that I am in no way saying that I understand or know fully the extent of your mental health concerns or anything like that. But from my experience, I think that um, we have a tendency as a people to kind of lock ourselves into um, into 
limiting ourselves, if that makes sense. Um, so when you say, since my emotional state is going to affect him, um, when he's not getting on the trailer and if I have to keep reapproaching him, I'm going to get upset. Um, those are things that, um, I have in my experience, cause I dealt with a lot of anxiety when I first started going to therapy. And in my experience, the phrases that we use about ourselves that are concrete and definitive, like saying, um, I'm anxious and like, no, you're not, <laughs> you're Jill, <laughs> like making it a part of your identity, um, can be really challenging, um, in terms of trying to do something that goes against that because people, I, I think I can speak generally here. Most people that are anxious don't really want to be anxious, but it becomes a part of your identity when you say things like I'm anxious or, well, I can't because I'll, I'll get anxious or, you know, if I do this, then I'm, I'm going to just, my emotions will go over the top. And I am not saying that everyone has control over this. Uh, a lot of people don't, and that is totally okay and fine. But I think that a lot of the people that deal with anxiety more on the lower end of the spectrum, like on the lower intensity s end of the spectrum, I guess, um, it, it can be worked through mentally and you can become a more confident person who can has the ability and the power within yourself to refute those things. And it can sound like a really challenging thing to do, um, you know, just listening to somebody ramble about it on a podcast. But I'm here to tell you, <laughs> I did it. And my anxiety was pretty, pretty bad at one point. Like I never went to any parties. I never went out. I hated going out on dates. I would always call people or take a propranolol, which is <laughs> a, uh, it's something people take for, I think, high blood pressure or something. It keeps your heart rate down. So you might think, think anxiously, but your body doesn't respond. Um, and, uh, I used to take that for competitions and also first dates. Um, so, uh, I, I just, I was like, I'm incapable of doing anything without that crutch. And again, I do want to say I am in no way trying to minimize anyone's experience with anxiety or other mental health issues. And, um, you know, if that is something that you need or you feel like you need, that is okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. It definitely helped me a lot in those situations. And only when I started going to therapy, did I realize that my personal experience with anxiety was not something that, um, you know, that I needed to be medicated for. It was something that I created, um, to essentially self handicap myself, um, like going to Walmart or talking to cashiers or going out on first dates. Um, all of those things were scary and uncomfortable to me. So instead of doing them and gaining confidence in those realms where I didn't have a lot of experience and are naturally a little disconcerting for most people, I would um, just say I can't do it at all so that I didn't have to even try or risk failing or feeling uncomfortable or embarrassed or anything like that. It was just easier to say that it's not something within the realm of possibility for me. I am incapable. And um, when I started going to therapy, my therapist pointed out that I was identifying so heavily with the anxiety by saying, I am anxious and I am anxiety. I have anxiety. And she was like, maybe just reword it. My experience with anxiety in this situation I felt anxious rather than being like, I'm so anxious right now, you know? Um, and I think that it sounds so dumb, <laughs> but that little shift in cognition and the way you process the world around you is so powerful because if you're looking at your world through a lens, um, of your inabilities, you can't see what you're capable of. And I think that that is a really powerful thing that you know, this is not something that we get taught in schools. We're taught how to do arithmetic and useful things, but nothing about how to manage our emotions and how to recognize our feelings and um, the power that we have within ourselves. And so um, <laughs> I'm particularly sensitive to language like that because I have experienced it in such an extreme way. And the contrast between when I identified so heavily with anxiety and when I started separating it from myself and then taking steps slowly successively approximating myself to being used to those things that used to scare me and that I thought I was incapable of doing like instead of going out on a first date I would go into a gas station and say hi to the cashier like a little little thing never have to see that person ever again in my life and so I got I slowly like essentially 
desensitize myself slowly um, instead of flooding, <laughs> which would be just going out on the date, um, and I would have panicked. Um, so slowly working my way up to gaining more confidence and being more comfortable and eventually ended up proving to myself that I didn't have anxiety <laughs> at all, really, outside of the situations where most people are a little bit unnerved or anxious. And um, so anyway, all of that to say that, um, you know, I would really encourage you to consider that a little bit. You know, I again, I have no idea what you're going through and what your circumstances are and your experience with anxiety is. But it is, it is a thing, you know, um, cause worrying about your emotional state affecting your horse and worrying that you're going to escalate. It's, I've talked about it before on the podcast. Um, you know, if you think, okay, don't think about the pink elephant. Suddenly all you can think about is a pink elephant. It's the same thing. You're like, okay, I'm so worried that I'm going to get anxious and that I'm going to upset my horse and then I'm going to fail and everything's going to go wrong. You're, you might end up accidentally manifesting that because that's all you're thinking about and that's all your brain can comprehend. So um, I read somewhere at one point that the brain cannot comprehend the don'ts and the nots. Like, don't think about the pink elephant. All your brain can think about is the pink elephant, not the not thinking about the pink elephant because what is the alternative? Nothing. (laughs) When the end of the sentence gives you um, something to think about. So when you say, oh my God, I'm so worried that I'm, I'm going to upset my horse and I'm going to scare him. That's all you're thinking about. Your body language gets tense. You raise your shoulders and you get tight in your body language and your face exhibits worry and your energy goes up. You start breathing faster and your horse is like, what is going on? And nothing has even happened yet. So if you set your intention, I know that sounds so stupid. Trust me, I am not a woo-woo person. <laughs> and when my therapist first had me do this stuff, I rolled my eyes at her and I was like, you have no idea what you're talking about. You don't know me. And but I promise for a lot of people, this does work. Um, before you go out with your horse, visualize it going well. Visualize it going the way that you want it to. And like play it out in your head and like feel how you would feel um, when you're experiencing those things, like feel when you go out to get him and he halters beautifully and he nuzzles you and you give him some snacks because you love him and you scratch him all up and then you lead him over to the trailer and maybe he deviates and takes a bite of grass and you just look at him lovingly because he's so obnoxious, but so cute. And you should probably work on that later, but not for now. And, uh, then you keep leading him over to the trailer and you just know he's going to be perfect and he's going to go on. And even if he doesn't, it's okay. He's a horse. And we are people. Sometimes things go wrong and that's fine. And we'll work through it. And we are both capable of getting this done and that's okay. And you know, he might not load and we'll just have to keep working on it and everything's going to be okay. Because in the grand scheme of things, I hate to say it because I hated when my therapist said this to me, but that teeny tiny little event does not matter in the grand scheme of things. You have a horse that is lovely and healthy and you love him and you are so beyond connected and intertwined with him. You know him backwards and forwards just the way he knows you backwards and forwards. And he can sense your worry. You're right. But I think that you could um, go a long way in mitigating that by um, helping him to sense confidence, that you have confidence in him. You believe that he is capable of getting on the trailer. You believe that you are capable of helping him get on the trailer. And you're both capable of being comfortable and confident in the situation. And you can be successful. It is within the realm of possibility. And um, you both have that power. I really think that goes a long way because you're like, think about the difference in the first situation that I described where your body's all tight and tense and your breathing is fast and everything is fast and you're worried. And when you're so wrapped up and deep in the situation versus the second scenario where you kind of zoom out and you look at it for what it is and it's just loading a horse on a trailer and it's not the end of the world. And while it can be very frustrating when you're in the moment, it's okay. You're going to figure it out. You guys have got this. You know your horse so well, and he knows you so well. And I know I've already said that, but it is, it's such an important part of all of it. Like the lesson in the trailer and all of that doesn't matter. What matters is your bond with your horse. And with, through that, you guys can work through this in a successful way that, you know, builds confidence for both of you and empowers both of you. And then you don't have to worry about this ever again you know, and I think when you take that perspective and you're able to zoom out and have confidence in the both of you, then you get better 
get better results because then that's all you're thinking about and you're projecting those positive thoughts and then you're taking actions to make the thing that you're visualizing happen rather than trying to prevent the thing you're visualizing from happening if that makes sense um so again i know it's super stressful like if all of that goes well and then you get him up to the trailer and he doesn't load and then you're instantly struck with this panic like fuck (laughs) what if he doesn't get on the trailer oh my god i have people waiting on me what's gonna happen and i think in that situation i'm sorry that's my alarm um the best thing to do would just be to laugh and be like oh my god here we go again i'm sorry everyone please just give me a second we'll work through this i know we've got this you know even if you don't believe it just say it and just laugh and look at your horse and remember why you do this because you love him and you love horses and you love riding positive thoughts it goes such a long way because when you think about the difference between again the first scenario where you're all tense and stressed because you're worried that your your horse isn't going to get on this trailer you're going to inconvenience everyone it sucks and then think about when you're just chilling in your pasture with your horse and you're looking at them and you love them and you're just filled with this sense of compassion and joy and peace So if you think about that in the scary scenario, your whole body position changes and your horse is like, oh, well, she's not worried about anything. She's not signaling to me via her body language or pheromones. I don't know if horses can spell those, but whatever. Um, And she doesn't look worried. She looks like she loves me and this is a comfortable, happy situation. And I feel a lot more at ease. And then your training can go a lot, a lot farther because you're not initially communicating to him that this is going to (laughs) suck. Um, so, um, you offered a few options in saying, keep going and risking you getting upset and keep reapproaching. Um, and you know, you shouldn't, but your brain doesn't understand how to not demand perfection and your brain does. (laughs) We all do. Um, but I mean, like think about your room perhaps, or your car. I mean, there, there has to be some facet of your life that you're okay with a little imperfection. I'm the same way. I I definitely have a strong, (laughs) nearly, uh, I don't want to, I don't know. My therapist mentioned that I've got a, a quite an OCD streak. And I think that that is in part, uh, ADHD compensation because otherwise I would forget everything. Um, so it can be really hard for me too to let go of that control and making everything go right. Because if everything goes right, then you're not inconveniencing anyone. You don't feel embarrassed. You don't look stupid or anything that you're fearing if everything goes right, but your mental health and your, Um, experience of your life and even these little moments cannot all be contingent on the your appearance to other people it can't be your life can't be about how other people see you and I think that um, you know I don't know if this is speaking to you at all (laughs) but I think a lot of the reasons we do anxiety um, type behaviors is because of the fear of rejection from the herd if you will And, um, I also hate inconveniencing people. So I totally, totally understand, but there has to be one facet of your life. Even as somebody as anal as me, there are facets that are not super clean and neat and organized and perfect. And so you are capable of not demanding perfection and you have the power to just take a breath and relax. And, um, it goes a long way for your health and, um, you know, not risking heart attacks, which is something I have to remind myself every day because cortisol is my drug of choice. (laughs) Apparently that and adrenaline, uh, because I live in a constant state of stress, but it is something I am working on. We are becoming mellow gill. Okay. Um, but the, it's interesting that the way you phrase the, um, the first option, um, keep reapproaching means that you're risking you getting upset. And I don't think it does. I think you can keep reapproaching without you getting upset. Um, I think that you are beyond capable. I don't think that the two are mutually exclusive. Um, I think that there is a circumstance where you could reapproach and not get upset. I think there's also a circumstance where you could do something else and get upset. You know, there are variations. Um, in the second option, you say be more firm with pressure when he's at the ramp, uh, and get it done in what seems to be a calm yet forceful way. Um, So that is an option and clearly it has worked before, but, um, I have seen this a lot and sometimes it works. It works for the horses and then you never have a problem ever again. Um, but sometimes it can also lead to more anxiety and fear around the trailering experience, particularly for you, if it's not something you're comfortable with and you feel really guilty and bad about having to, you know, tap your horse to get him onto the trailer. That is a personal thing. Some people are not bothered by it and that is a separate issue, but if you are, 
bothered by it, then, you know, you're creating a not so fun experience for you. And I'm sure the horse also doesn't enjoy being tapped on the bum to go in somewhere he is resisting. Um, and then another option is remove yourself from the situation and let someone else load him. I think that the best person to load him is the person that knows him best and that he trusts the most being you. Um, and I think that you are beyond capable because your message definitely demonstrates that you're an intelligent, thoughtful, and self-aware person. Um, but I think that if you just slightly shift the way you're thinking about it, I think you will see a world of difference. And, um, I think that you are capable for sure. Um, and I would not say (laughs) to everyone, I'm sorry, everyone listening, I'm speaking directly to one person right now. Um, but I have received some messages before in the past on DMS and stuff that I'm like, "Mm, I don't know if you're going to get it all, (laughs) but, um, you definitely sound like this is something you're really passionate and you really care about. And that's half the battle you know, and then just having the confidence in yourself to be able to do it in a way that, um, you know, promotes that confidence instead of, um, you know, being so afraid of the whole thing. Um, you know, I think that it would go a long way to, um, believe that (laughs) in the confidence that you have in you believe, have confidence in the power that you have in you. That's what I'm trying to say. Not being super eloquent tonight. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So, or remove both of us from the situation entirely. I don't think that that is, um, I mean, that's certainly an option, but if you want to go to your lesson and go train and stuff, I don't think that you have to resign your horse to never loading ever again. Um, a, it's a safety issue. If something were to ever go wrong, he needs to know how to get on a trailer. Um, you know, just like a lot of horses, um, you know, for mine, I want them to know how to give to pressure in the event that I die and they get sold. Um, they need to know how to be a horse, quote unquote, and be able to survive in the current world. So, um, I think that it's definitely doing him a favor by working on this. So I don't think that you necessarily have to give up entirely. Um, But so I think I want to do like a combination of these options. Um, So what I would do is ask your friend on a very neutral day when there is nothing going on and just be like, hey, would you mind bringing your trailer out? I will pay you or whatever you need to offer to get it to happen. Or if you're close, just be like, please, I just really need this, Um, you know. Um, could you bring the trailer out? And I really want to work on this with Falcon so that we don't have problems on days where we're all in a hurry, you know, and, um, that way you could have the trailer there. And then in order to work through it, like I said, this seems like a very simple (laughs) one of these solutions because he's not, you know, rearing and flipping over or backing up or aggressively jumping out of the trailer, hitting his head or swinging side to side or kicking out at people that those are very common things that happen with trailer loading. So this is a very docile situation, um, which is awesome. And that will definitely work in your favor. So I hope that gives you some confidence (laughs) at least that he's not, he's not being explosive or bad. He just seems a little concerned, not so much anxious or like over the top, he's exploding. Um, but he's just a little bit worried about it. So I think that giving him that confidence that this is a good experience, it's a good thing, um, and creating a positive association with the trailer will go a really long way for him. And it might take a couple of sessions. So, you know, when your friend is there, just be like, I've got this thing I want to try. It might look a little weird. I'm sorry. I know I'm the woo woo hippie lady, but I really want him to have a good experience and love getting in the trailer rather than, you know, forcing him into it. And, um, I think this will go a long way. So just hang with me. I know it's weird. Um, (laughs) I tend to do a lot of those disclaimers and uh, self-deprecation because it makes people not say it first. (laughs) Um, But it's also acknowledging that I know it's not the norm, Um, but probably shouldn't do that. But as a woman, I was raised to apologize for things that I do. So thanks society. (laughs) Um, Anyway, so I would have your friend bring out the trailer and preface with whatever you need to, or if they're understanding, just be like, yo, I want to work on this. Um, And then get him out. And you know, while you're with him in the pasture, just take a couple of deep breaths and think of five things that you really love in the world or five things that you really love about your horse. And then try and visualize, like I said, step by step, break it down in your brain all the way down to the Itiest, bittiest little component, each step to the trailer, and think about what it would look like if it went in the best way possible. And um, then I want you to practice the emotions that would go with that and thinking about how 
um, you would feel, not only just envisioning it going well, but how it would feel, and then try to maintain that if you can. And it may take some time, but you know, when you catch him, just be like, okay, it's good. We've got this. And if it doesn't happen on the first try or the 50th try, that's okay. We will be fine. Nobody's going to die. My head's not going to spin off. Everything is okay. And we'll try again another day. Sorry. Didn't mean to be a poet. (laughs) Um, but then you can, um, walk him over to the trailer, let him sniff it. And um, if you want to use positive reinforcement, I would back up a little bit and, you know, just when, like when you get him haltered, give him a treat and then lead him out of the field, give him some more treats. Alternatively, if he knows targeting, um, this could be really helpful as well. Um, And, you know, you might do that in between when your friend is able to bring out the trailer and get him really, really good at targeting because that is a lot of the way that many people teach their horses to get on trailers is because when the horse has got this big box, they're like, I don't know what you want me to do. Um, you know, I normally get beaten for being around this thing, so I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Um, and if you use targeting, suddenly they're like, oh, I know what that is. I know exactly what I'm supposed to do. And, um, you know, they'll touch it and then they'll figure it out eventually. And then you get one foot and then two foot and then three foot. And um, you can slowly work up to getting them all the way in. And I wouldn't work on this for more than like 20 minutes. If it doesn't happen, that's all right. Um, And you can try again another day. Maybe you ask your friend if you can drive the trailer, if you could come pick it up and keep it for a few days and then bring it back um, just so you could work on it. But I would really recommend using the targeting method. But if you're not comfortable with that, um, that's fine. You can just do what I was saying earlier, where you click him for each step he takes closer to the trailer. And then when you get up to the trailer and you get inside it, I would click and treat, click and treat him for smelling it. And then, um, you know, you can hang out around it or you can back up a little bit and then just wait and see what he does. And if he gets frustrated or he tries to leave, you might have uh, increased your criteria too quickly. So you need to go back down a step and then slowly start breaking it down for each little movement or step or muscle twitch in the direction of the trailer. An ear flick, an eye, a nose smelling, anything get him in the trailer and then you can start hesitating for half a second and seeing if he offers to put a foot in the trailer um it sounds like he has been trailered a few times before he's not terrified of the trailer so this should go faster than uh, most horses but also you're giving him a choice this time so maybe it won't and that's fine too and some horses when you give them a choice they're like oh well nothing bad's gonna happen um and you know it might go a little bit slower but then they eventually learn that um you know, it'll be all right. It's a good thing to get in the trailer. I'll get good things when I get in there. And maybe you give them a big flake of alfalfa, you know, in the hay bag. So it smells really good in there. And that way, um, you know, it's just an overall really good experience. And then, you know, just each time he gets in the trailer, give him more snacks. And I think that would really solve your problem is just taking the time to actually train it rather than just be like, okay, we got to (laughs) go. You know, I think you did, you made the right call the first time where you were like, okay, 45 minutes, please. And you know, maybe each time you have a lesson, um, for the first, like, you know, couple of weeks, go ahead and give it like 45, 30 minutes before just to be safe. And then you can start slowly decreasing the time and, when you start decreasing the time, try not to let fear take hold of you and try not to let that be what um, controls the situation. Because, you know, if you start decreasing the time and then you go back to being panic and stressed and tense because you've changed a variable and that happens when you change a variable, sometimes we um, have a resurgence of behavior or um, emotional reactivity. So when you go back um, to shorter time spans, make sure you're keeping that same energy and that same confidence and same wherewithal to know that if it doesn't happen, it's okay, you know, and you know, it might be annoying to your friend. Maybe you'll have to buy your dinner, but you know, just it's all right. (laughs) It's not the end of the world. And I know that's so patronizing to say, but I'm not meaning it in a patronizing or condescending way. It is not the end of the world. Your horse is safe. You are safe. Everybody's okay. And it just means you might have to take a little more time. And you are doing what is best for your horse in the long run, in my opinion, because you are taking the time to create a safe and comfortable and positive experience for the horse rather than um, one that is based in potentially you being scarier or more threatening than the thing that the horse is ambivalent or afraid of. Um, so 
that is what I have to say. Did not mean for that to turn into sort of a mental health ramble, but I think um, that message has gone a really long way for me personally and for a lot of people in my life. Um, It's just so weird because we don't notice how much we identify with things and how much we self-handicap. And again, not everyone is self-handicapping and I don't want you to go around listening to people that say they have anxiety and be like, oh my God, you're doing that on purpose to avoid the situations. It's never never cognizant. We are never aware that we're doing that. It was only when my therapist pointed it out to me that I was like, fuck you, you're wrong. You don't know me. You don't know what you're talking about. And then I thought about it and I was like, oh shit, she's right. And then I started just trying what she was saying and then it worked. And I was like, oh, that's legit. So anyway, all that to say that you are more capable than you think you are always. And uh, I will also say it is better to suffer from Dunning-Kruger than, um, or the imposter syndrome or effect. It's the imposter effect than Dunning-Kruger, which is where the imposter effect is where you think um, you don't know anything at all (laughs) and you actually know more. Um, So the more you know, the less you think you know. And Dunning-Kruger is the less you know, the more you think you know. And that is the most frustrating person to deal with ever. The people that have little to no education on a topic and um, act like they're the authority on it. <laughs> so you, you've you got all the right tools and you're in the perfect situation to make this happen in a really positive way and confidence building experience for both of you. Um, but you just need a little bit of a push. And and I think you got it. You know, I that what I suggested is not an alternative listed here. So I'm hoping that that is somewhat helpful if you haven't considered it already. I also know that there are some trailer loading videos on YouTube. Fair Horsemanship is a really awesome one. She has a book called Humane Science-Based Horse Training. Um, it's on Amazon. Her name is Elise Viard, 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 uh, Muckenstrom. Uh, it's French and I'm stupid. <laughs> so, um, but it's on Amazon. It's not super expensive. And she has a walkthrough on trailer loading as well as teaching targeting and all of that stuff. So maybe if you want to work on this long term and you want to build up by working on targeting first, maybe take a month off of lessons or something and just work on targeting, getting it really strong. You're able to target him anywhere inside the pasture, outside the pasture, all around the farm. You've generalized it to all different locations. So he knows. And then, um, then you can, um, you know, move on to doing the trailer. Sorry, I keep getting text messages and getting mildly distracted. Um, But anyway, I hope this was helpful for somebody out there, including you, patron. Um, But yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next question, which is significantly shorter, um, and hopefully will not take me another 45 minutes to explain. Um, But let's get into it. So patron Rachel asks, I have a stallion that I got back in May. Basically, I got him because I bought a horse last July and didn't know she was pregnant. She fold out this past March, a beautiful bay filly, and the stud was doing nothing with the previous owner. So I just figured I'd buy him, register him and go from there. Uh, he's an eight year old appendix and was around uh, people until he was a yearling. Then he got turned out until, like I said, I got him a few months ago. They told me he was awful to halter, hadn't had his feet done in years, you know, the whole nine yards just basically thrown out in a pasture to do nothing. I got him here and approached him super slowly. He was in a falling stall at the time and was able to just, and I was able to just put a halter on him and give him a, a bunch of scratches and it's been great ever since. Uh, we've been doing positive reinforcement. I got him started under saddle and he's honestly awesome. His demeanor is incredible. So here's the question. I've reached out to some of my friends that have stallions as well, and they've all told me that I need to be dominant, the leader, and not let him get away with anything. My plan in the future is to barrel race him, so he's going to have to be very close to mares and not act on any of his urges. He will be gelded, but that's not possible right now financially. I just don't know how to keep him in check throughout his career without putting him in his place, as people have told me. I mean, obviously, if I'm in a situation that would become dangerous, dangerous, I'll do what I have to do. I can't talk. I'll do what I have to do, but I'm just not sure how to train it. So my first inclination to say here is, well, first, I should make the disclaimer that I have yet to work with a stallion. I have no experience working with stallions. We had three out here at one point, and I never came into contact with them outside of feeding them. (laughs) So um, it's not my forte. But I, um, I will say a horse is a horse, um, and history is history, and that 
in most cases, stallions are really not too much different from regular horses, but they do tend to grow up with people that interact with them as if they are inherently dangerous and awful creatures. <laughs> and like I said in the um, patron question asking about the um, trailering, when you interact with an animal as if it is going to kill you and therefore you are afraid, that animal is like, what are we afraid of? <laughs> and they get afraid and uncomfortable and they lose confidence and they learn that being around humans is scary and uncomfortable. And on top of that, stallions are often, you know, used or I guess moved by having chains and um, like stud chains and they're literally called stud chains <laughs> and um, whips and all sorts of things. You get, um, they get this stigma that they're just going to be awful when if, when they're brought up, they're trained well um, and they have good experiences with people. They tend to be fairly easy to manage. I have known many studs in my lifetime that were perfect, amazing competition horses that never crossed a line, so to speak, at a show. They wouldn't kick out at other horses, pin their ears, or act any quote-unquote study behavior. Um, and while, of course, hormones and testosterone, which is a hormone, uh, you know, and nature are going to play a role, and it's not going to be perfect every single time, but training and history does really go a long way. With this guy, he's eight, which is still fairly young, but if he hasn't been socialized with other horses, it will be more difficult. If he was just kicked out in a field with other horses, I mean, you, you're off to a better start, but if he was just kicked out into a field and no, he never interacted with other horses, it'll be difficult, much like a dog that... Um, you know, when you get a puppy, everyone says you must socialize it. Otherwise, you're going to create a fearful, aggressive dog. And then they tend to attack and hurt people or other dogs. And so you have to socialize them to people and to the other animals. Same goes for stallions. And that's just all the steps that you can take to try and mitigate that behavior. You know, if you're bringing up a young colt. Um, so that said, um, with that said, my inclination is to say I would not, um, like, I don't know how insensitive it is to say, but from a very basic um, solution to the situation is don't spend money on barrel races and save for getting him gelded. I am not the biggest fan of breeding in the entire world. And uh, especially if you're not planning to breed him and it's not financially possible right now, I would just keep him at home and work with him and really refine your skills until it is f financially um, an option to have him gelded because in my opinion that is the safest and most responsible thing to do if you're going to take him into an environment where there are other people and other horses you don't want to risk them getting hurt and if you don't know how he is um, or if you know that he acts on his urges then I would say it's probably best just to avoid the situation entirely so you don't risk anybody else or him getting hurt or you getting hurt. And, um, you know, there's so much more to do, especially if you just got him a few months ago. There's plenty of time. You could work with him for a year. He would still be pretty young. And, um, you know, just save up. And uh, I know it's really hard to hold off on competition and you want to get into it immediately <laughs> and, um that's the fun part of horses, but um, I'm here to tell you, there are other things that are super enjoyable and very rewarding. I mean, imagine the difference in the horse that you would have if you took him out right now and went to go to a barrel race and showed him and how much better he would be if you waited a year and really worked on building his top line and his hind end and strength training and making him the strongest, most refined competitor. Um, you know, that you could have, you know, and then you take the time to do the training properly and you won't be as likely to rush and, um, you know, risk him. I did that with Zoe. I definitely took her up the levels way too fast. And now we're dealing with a lot of the fallout from her carrying herself improperly and injuring her hawks and her back and all of that good stuff. And, um, I keep saying, and I'm, I'm very sorry. I'm sure that's getting annoying, but yeah, so that is my ideal solution. I know it's hard. Like I said, nobody wants to hold off on the fun part and then do the responsible thing. <laughs> that sucks. But 
I really think it would go a long way if uh, you were able to wait. And I think you would see a much um, lower stress situation because you wouldn't be so worried about him potentially doing something else, especially if you don't know what he does. And it might be worth having a few friends over and seeing like how he interacts around their horses with a fence in between you two. Just keep everybody safe, you know. Um, but just seeing how he goes and that'll give you a lot of information too. It just sounds like, I mean, and I could be totally wrong, but from your message, it sounds like you're still getting to know him and you don't really know his tendencies and his people haven't really worked with him a whole lot. So who knows if he's been ridden around other horses before, how he acts and if he's not bad, quote unquote bad, um, or behaving like a stallion who hasn't been socialized is more accurate, um, then you might not have a problem. But if he does act steady, um, then I, I would say that the solution that I offered is probably the best one. Um, I obviously, you guys have listened to my dominance theory episodes, um, from season two, they're episodes 30 and 31. And then I did, I think 35 was the join up episode. Um, And those are all about dominance theory and why I don't believe it should be used in training. And I am editing the video for YouTube. Don't worry. It's coming. It's just slow going. It took me four hours to edit five minutes of that video. And I still have 40 minutes of footage left to edit. So it's taking a while um, on top of everything else. But I will get to it. I promise it's coming. Um, But yeah, so I definitely don't think that just because he's a stallion, you know, that that rule doesn't apply. I don't think you need to be dominant or the leader or put him in his place. What that means is you just force him to suppress his urges, which is, I believe, called conditioned suppression. It's like the step below learned helplessness. And um, I think that's on the, mm, it's on one of my resources um, it's like meadow family farm or something.com. It's on, it's linked in one of the dominant theory episodes. I don't know. Um, but anyway, she talks about, um, why dominant theory, um, is harmful and that it potentially causes condition suppression or learned helplessness. And essentially that's just where the horse is too afraid to, um, act out condition suppression is where the horse knows that the consequences will be worse if he does act out. Um, and, so he just suppresses them much like, um, you know, I don't know if you're like really scared and for some reason you're not allowed to move. Otherwise it, the situation will escalate and, um, you just can't show that you're afraid. And that is not an ideal. (laughs) You don't want to have to do that or beat a horse into, um, being more afraid of you than, Um, and that being a stronger motivator than what his body is telling him to do. And again, not all studs are like that. It really depends on history and socialization, um, among other factors, of course, but typically. Um, so yeah, I would just say that, um, you know, you don't need to be putting him in his place or anything like that. So that's certainly one way to approach it. And sometimes it's effective or particularly with studs you might end up seeing a very aggressive horse if they don't go the route of condition suppression, learned helplessness, which I, if I haven't said it already, learned helplessness is, uh, when they essentially learn that, um, exhibiting emotion or trying out new behaviors or acting on anything other than what you're telling them, um, that will end up badly and they just sort of give up. It's like, if you've ever seen that meme of the horse tied to a lawn chair, like a plastic yard chair. And they're like, it's not, it's all in your head. You know, (laughs) it's not the, the thing that's holding you back is not as strong as you think it is or whatever. Um, one of those dumb memes, but it is a perfect example of learned helplessness. The horse has learned, you know, a lot of people, will train horses to stand in cross ties or stand tied at a trailer by tying them to a quote unquote patience pole (laughs) and where the horse can pull back, it can fall down, it can flip over, it can do anything that it wants until it just gives up and it stands at the pole. You watched it happen in spirit, except they never broke his spirit because his name is spirit. (laughs) Um, but why is spirit so relevant in this episode? I don't know. That's funny. Um, but anyway, so that is one route to take. And then the horse learns that they have no other option and they just sort of go dead inside and just give up around you. And they typically hate you. (laughs) They don't want to be around. They don't want to be caught. They look angry all the time or they look dead, um, in their expression. I mean, 
Um, so I would not recommend going that route because that is typically the extent that you have to go to to get it to work, especially with, um, you know, horses that might be more motivated to act out against that because of what their hormones are telling their brain to do. But if you go, or if they, t- if they choose to go the opposite route, which is increased aggression, then you run the risk of you, him, or someone else getting hurt. And I just don't think that either of those options are very fantastic. So I would say that the best thing to do is to keep doing what you're doing. It's awesome that you've used positive reinforcement and you've started him under saddle and you love him and he's great. That is not really the story that we hear from, you know, nearly feral stallions. Um, So this is already a success story. And I think you have taken all the necessary um, precautions and measures to really set him up for success. And if it were my horse, I would continue doing that because if you just, in my opinion, it would be not ensuring his success to just take him to an event and see what happens and then beat him if something goes wrong. I don't really like to um, (laughs) do that to the horses. I, I do do impulsive things in my life, but when it concerns other people or other animals, um, I try to make the situation be set up for success. And I think that you just not knowing anything about what could happen and then just relying on the fact that you can beat him, (laughs) you know, I mean, I know that's not what you said, but like, you know, you said, if the situation became dangerous, you do what you have to do. And of course, that's what we all do. We don't want to get him, you or anybody else hurt. So that is justified. But the goal, the entire goal of training in any discipline with any horse, any gender, any breed, anything, the goal of training is to prevent and to set the animal up for success so that you don't have to do those things. That's the humane hierarchy. And you can find that on online, just type in humane hierarchy of behavior modification or something. And, um, then you find that you want to set the animal up for success with, you know, making sure they're healthy medically and physically, all that good stuff. Um, And then you want to make sure that you do occasion setting or antecedent arrangement where you set up the environment for success, which would be, in my opinion, getting him gelded just as an extra precaution. And then I would, um, you know, start training him to be around other people and in those environments in successive approximations rather than just going from one day he's home chilling in his herd and his pasture or whatever. And then all of a sudden he's thrown on a trailer and then he's at this new place and he's like, whoa, there's, there are a lot of horses. There are a lot of mares. There are so many smells. I don't know what's going on. My person is, you know, trying to get me to behave and I'm freaking out, you know, work him up to it, especially if he's never really interacted or been near other horses before, like a lot of stallions. Um, It's really important that you slowly start introducing him to other horses and get him used to it just like you would with anything else. Like we said with the trailer, success of approximation, making sure everybody's comfortable and confident and used to it. It, um, you know, oh God, (laughs) I've lost the word. Um, I guess being good at something comes with practice. You cannot just expect the horse to load on the trailer when it's never seen a trailer before. You cannot just expect the stallion that has never been around other horses before to be perfect at an event. Again, I don't know if this horse has been paddocked with other horses or not. I didn't read that. Um, It says he was around people until he was a yearling, but then he got kicked out into a field until he was eight. So um, I would assume that it's probably a solitary pen, perhaps. I don't know. But like I said, I think that you would be giving him the best shot at being successful and you guys the best shot at being safe and happy and comfortable with each other and avoiding all of that nastiness. Um by waiting until you can get him gelded so that you don't have to deal with the hormones that are conflicting with his training. You don't have to compete for his motivation. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if anybody has any qualms with keeping horses studs, but I'm, I kind of see it like (laughs) how we do with cats, you know, there's just like neuter, spay and release. (laughs) And, uh, we have way too many horses in this world as it is. And they, I I just, I mean, I live on a a breeding farm, so I can't speak too much. I'm definitely not holier than thou. And for a hot moment, I wanted to breed Zoe, but, um, I, as a general rule, I'm like, uh, I don't know about it. (laughs) So, um, especially if you're already, if you've already decided that you want to get him gelded at some point, I think that the most responsible thing to do for him and your well-being and your safety and 
your success as a competitor um, or a competitive team would be to just hold off. There's so much you can work on in between. How does he trailer? How does he stall? How does he lead to and fro the paddock? How is he around treats? Can he stand on a mat still? Does he tie well? Um, you know, is he comfortable with the saddle? Is he comfortable with the girth? Does he turn well? Does he accelerate off of voice cues or do you have to kick the shit out of him? Like there's so much in between that you can work on. Beyond that, you could teach him tricks. There's so much fun things. There's so many fun things you could do as well. Um, and it doesn't have to be all about work and no play. And you can just take the time, take the year to get to know your horse and build your rapport with him and your relationship and, um, know him backwards and forwards before you guys run off and go on a competition. And I'm not saying I've definitely like the first time I ever rode Zoe was at a competition. So, I mean, definitely again, not on my high horse here, but if I could go back in time, that is what I would have done. Obviously she is not a stallion, but I, if I would go back in time, I would 110% restart her from the ground, strength training from the ground classically, with positive reinforcement though, (laughs) and, um, work on building her top line and strengthening her, really refining the cues and completely giving her a fresh start, a full education and understanding of what's going on before I ever even considered taking her off the property to go show. And beyond that, I would have taken her to, you know, a farm down the street and ridden there for a little bit, or maybe even just gotten her off the trailer and walked her around, you know, just little itty bitty, teeny tiny steps so that they get comfortable and they feel confident and everybody is set up for success and safety. That is the number one concern with all of this because, you know, I don't want to see you get hurt. You don't want to see you get hurt. You don't want to see your horse get hurt. So I, I just really would, if it were me, I would definitely take the time to focus on some other areas other than competition. And, um, you know, work on saving money so that you can, um, get them cut if it's possible. And, uh, that way, you know, you can start working on having him live a normal horse life because, you know, I think me and Shelby talked about this in the stalling episode that studs tend to be, um, housed alone and away from other horses. And even though we don't, you know, (laughs) we don't want a bunch of little baby horses, running around everywhere, even though it sounds like a dream world, it is not the reality, (laughs) you know, they get very expensive and it's dangerous. And, um, you just don't want all your mares getting bred willy nilly, no pun intended. Um, (laughs) but, um, they are designed to be in a herd. They are still a horse. It is a basic need to be with other horses. And a lot of stallions like, um, Shelby has Banksy out with all of her other horses. Granted, they are all male, but he is out with them and he is not cut. And we have our colts out, though they are not mature enough yet to be doing any scandalous behavior. Um, They're out with all the other horses. They're being socialized and they will be gelded when they are of age. And so, I mean, I really think that you set him up for a not only successful and safe competitive career, but also with the ability to, um, have a full enriched and all of his needs met in his life, you know? Um, so I hope that makes sense. And that was probably not the answer you wanted. I'm sorry. I don't have a magical positive reinforcement training solution for that, where you just like teach him to turn his head away from mares or something. Um, but if he has never been around other mares before and, um, he, is, you know, he doesn't know how to self-regulate and you take him off the property and he just really wants to go after these mares, your cue is probably not going to be listened to because the food is not more motivating than where his interest is. You know, he is going to be more motivated by trying to investigate or, you know, sex, (laughs) this mare, than, um, your alfalfa pellets, to be frank. Um, even if you have sugar cubes, still probably not going to outweigh the, the old sexual drive. So I just, I really think, especially since there's so many unknowns, like, like I said, the longer question took me longer to read, have more information. This one, I don't know what you know, and I am in no way trying to, um, again, patronize or condescend 
in any way like that. I just don't know your situation. I can't know because that's that's a four paragraph message. I just there's no way I could know your entire situation. But I hope that this was somewhat helpful and provided some sort of um, guidance if that's what you wanted. Um, maybe an alternate solution to what you were considering. I don't know. Whatever, 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 whatever. And I hope that those of you listening, um, you know, you learned something. Um, but I am going to go ahead and wrap up this episode because it is late o'clock and I have to get up in the morning and do human things and hopefully get to work with some ponies tomorrow. Actually, I've been glued to my table all day working on my laptop and reading and a bunch of lame shit. (laughs) So, um, be sure to follow us and check us out on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter at Jet Equitheory and Equitheory on some of those platforms as well. I'll let you figure it out. You get to search and hunt to see where Equitheory is. Um, and I am slowly working on putting this podcast on YouTube as well. There is an account right now, but it is not very big, but if you guys want to go ahead and find it and, um, subscribe to it, that would be super helpful because I can't put ads on it until I have like a thousand subscribers and I created a new channel because I didn't want to saturate Jenic with your It's a whole thing. Um, but yeah, that would be fantastic because then we could start making some money off this podcast. I'm going to try and get some ads on these episodes so that I can, um, make some money because I, I hate posting them without any ads. Cause I'm like, ah, oh, I need money. I'm so poor. And I'm trying to go to a hoof clinic in Texas, which is going like, it's $250 a, a class. And I have to take two of them. Plus I had to buy all the tools, which totaled about 200 bucks. So, um, very expensive and I am eating fruit snacks a lot lately. So, um, you know, priorities, what's, what's health, <laughs> um, uh, which is probably contributing to the anxiety, you know, cause diet has an impact on all that, but whatever. Who's a me- clinical mental health counseling student? It's not me. Um, <laughs> I should know better, but priorities again. Um, but anyway, I hope that you guys enjoyed this episode and you can follow me in all the places, follow the YouTube and be sure to check out jetequitheory.com. That is my website where I am continually, trying to add all of the resources that I come across, um, in my ever evolving education as an equestrian and trainer and horse caretaker, I guess. Um, I just, I want to share everything that I learned with you guys and I'm trying to organize it in a way that is super accessible and clear. Um, the education page is up on my site, but it's currently empty. So just kind of hang with me. Well, it's empty on the topics page because I haven't had time to sort everything or figure out the layout that I want, but whatever, that's boring and you don't care. (laughs) Um, but it's coming. So be sure to check back with that frequently. Save it in your favorites on your phone. If you'd like, be sure to subscribe to this podcast, leave a review. If you are on an app where you can do that because it helps boost the podcast and it helps it be more visible to other people. And we can hopefully bring more people to the dark side of positive reinforcement. I don't know food rewards for animals. That is my mission. (laughs) Anyway, thank you guys so much for listening to this rather long episode that I really did not want to record because it is so late and I am so tired, but now I get to go to bed. So, um, thank you guys for listening and tuning in as always. It means the world. And I just hope that we can keep growing our little, little podcast family. Oh, also be sure to support me on Patreon if you can for as little as a cup of coffee a month. Did I steal that from the come along for the ride podcast? Sure did. Um, if you can just cut out one cup of coffee a month, then you can pay to support me. And you also get some cool benefits like being able to ask me questions. Um, and if you can cut out two cups of coffee a month, $10 a month, you can ask me any number of questions that you want, but you already heard that in the Patreon ad, I think maybe, I don't know. Um, but you can go to patreon.com slash equitheory or click the link on my website under the support tab and you can see all the services I offer at the different tiers and you can look at them and pick which one works best for you and help us out. That would be fantastic. And I would really like to eat something other than fruit snacks. So, you know, I'm guilting you into this. Please, please do it. (laughs) Negative reinforcement over here. You will alleviate your guilt at not feeding me if you subscribe to the Patreon. Is that ethical? Should I not be saying that? It's fine. You figured it out. It's okay. Anyway, thank you guys so much for listening. I'm going to go ahead and end this, and I will catch you guys next Tuesday. Bye.